Crucial Slicer version 2.3 has been out for a little while and I'm really enjoying using it and the new features it has built in. So I thought I'd make a quick video to share with you guys the three things that it can now do that I'm finding really powerful. And also I wanna air my suggestion for one possible future feature for this software. So let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Makers Muse and welcome back to another 3D Printing 101. So I've been using Crucial Slicer for a very, very long time and their rate of development in this software has been ridiculous. It gets developed and updated and features added to it so quick. Um, and I'm, often, I'm often a few versions behind and um, much, to this, much to the annoyance of Joseph himself, but I had to upgrade to the latest version just because these new features they've implemented are just so useful for my workflow. And I just wanted to share them with you here today. So let's start with probably the most useful thing that you should know about in 2.3, and that is paint on support. So previously, if you wanted to do custom supports for an object, you'd have to use support enforcers or support blockers in uh, in Prusa Slicer, or in other slices, you may have the option to do manual supports where you put in pillars, but it's a little bit, a little bit tedious, but paint on supports is something that I'm really finding super, super handy. So here's the Gary Anderson cap. This is one of my favorite demo models and it needs support material for that overhanging head. So previously what I would do is a support enforcer block for the head, just to make sure that support was only generated for that area. But now it's so easy to use paint on supports instead. So if you click the object here on the left hand side, we have paint on supports and you can choose either to enforce supports by left clicking or to block supports by right clicking. You can see here the brush size, I can change that to be a bit bigger. So I'm gonna just make that a little bit larger. I prefer to use the sphere option instead of the circle. It just seems to be a bit more uh, consistent for me. And the overhanging area I wanna support is here under the chin of the cat. So I can just go here and there's hold down left click and then this whole, where this blue area is, that's where supports are going to be uh, generated. If you go into print settings and under support material, you need to make sure generate support material is ticked, but auto generated supports is not ticked. Otherwise it's gonna put supports everywhere as per usual. And here you can see after we've sliced, we've got that nice column holding that head in place and the overhang. So it's nicely supported and breaks away, but there's no support anywhere else that we have to worry about manipulating support angles and thresholds to try to turn it on and off in certain areas. You just paint it straight on. And it's definitely by far out of anything they've added to this software, gonna make my life so much easier for models like this. But let's say you wanna go the other way around. You have automatic supports turned on and it's filling the model with supports. It might be very complex and too hard to do manually. And you wanna instead make certain areas not have supports. Then in this case, we can go in and we can use the support blocker by doing a right click. So for example, with the Gco preview, it's got support for this little earring area. Let's just say, I don't want it there. I'll just right click. You can see that area is now red with a support blocker. Same with this one. And now when it's sliced again, even though automatic supports is turned on, it's no longer gonna put supports in those areas because we have support blocked them using the painting method. So really, really handy. Another new feature I'm very excited about is seam painting. So the application of seam painting is very similar to painting on supports and support blockers. But in this case, we're telling the software where to put its seam. So when a, when a printer does a perimeter for each layer, it has to start and stop. And that's where you have a seam. And that seam is generally visible in the print. So the software, the slicer itself, will try to hide them in uh, corners and that. But sometimes for models, for example, like the Gary Anderson Cat, um, it can put them in areas that are unsightly. And usually uh, it'll be here. So where this emblem is, it'll put seams here that ruins the look of it. So to avoid this happening in the past, I'd often have to do a seam alignment for universally aligning the seams to a certain direction, but that's not really very good. But now what I can do instead is I can either left click to enforce where seams should be or right click again, similar to support to uh, block where seams would be placed. So what I wanna do here is actually make this, uh, make the brush size quite large. And then I'm gonna right click and I'm just gonna block out this little emblem here because I don't want I don't want seams uh, to be in that area. However, with the legs, I might wanna enforce the seams to be in the back of the legs. Like they might be placed there automatically, but I can get a bit more control by actually placing them there myself. So I can, for example, just draw down here behind the leg. It's not really that neat, but um, it'll help sort of enforce where it's gonna be like so, like that. And here we have the resulting sliced file. Now it's a bit difficult to see uh, seams in Prusa Slicer. Maybe that's a feature that could be added 
Uh, you can turn retractions on, but as you can see, not really helping my case. Uh, but I'll zoom in on the legs, for example, and you'll be able to see these uh, little points here where the line is broken. Those are our seams, and it's conformed to my enforcement of placing those seams behind the leg where I want them, so it's gonna be less obvious. And if you look at the emblem here, you can see that there's no, no seams in that area. They'll be moved elsewhere, like here on the side. Whether or not that's better or not, I don't know. You might have to mess around with the feature, but it's really cool to give you that bit of control. And it's really cool because in areas I haven't told it to support or block seams, it's just gonna follow the settings I've already got under print settings, which should be uh, to follow the seam position of nearest. And you can change this independently to your seam painting to override it. And next we have a variation on one of my favorite types of infill. I've been using Cubic a lot. It's one, still one of my favorite infills because it has that nice 3D effect to it without being too complicated. I know it's not the best or strongest infill, but it's my favorite. But now we have two new variations which are Adaptive Cubic and Support Cubic, which can vary their density to make a model print quicker and use less material, but end up with the same final, same final result. So for example, in the settings, I can go and choose uh, Cubic, which is what I normally would print with, 20%, sure. This is a bench that's been scaled up by 300%. Uh, so it's gonna be quite a large benchy. And the preview is saying this benchy is gonna take 19 hours, and you can see with the Cubic infill, it's consistent through the entire model as it goes up. It's not changing density at all. And the model will print fine, it's just gonna take 19 hours. But let's go back in and try the new cubic settings. So let's go to uh, infill, I'm gonna try adaptive cubic. And with adaptive cubic, we've already got a savings of two hours, it's going down to 17 hours. And if we go down the model, with adaptive cubic, it's changing its density to match the geometry. So in certain large areas, there's less it's less dense, and then towards the edges, it's more dense, and as it gets close to, uh, to supporting a top solid fill, it'll become more dense and it goes up like that. But the setting that will save the most time and material is support cubic that has very low density to begin with, but then becomes more dense as it comes up towards uh, geometry that needs to support over the top of it. And again, this benchy is quite large, so something like that can be quite useful. Also a quick note, even though there's very sparse infill at the start of this print, you can see that Precious Slice is putting in this solid infill support at the bow of the boat. And that's really important because it helps keep the shape of this model because it's quite a steep overhang. And as the model builds up to the front of the boat here, it's doing the same thing just on the reverse side as it fills in the top of the print. So it's really cool to see that even with a sparse infill, that Prism Slicer will sort of do these small details to ensure the geometric accuracy of the 3D print. All right, so we've gone through the three features in Prism Slicer 2.3 that I think are really handy. And I'm usually one that will sort of try to avoid upgrading uh, the software I use, because I use something that I know it works, because I'm very time sensitive, I don't want things to break, but the new functionality in the latest Precious Slicer is really, really worth checking out if you haven't already. But there's one thing I wouldn't, wouldn't mind seeing added. Um, so what I have here is my Lattice Cube Torture Test, very, very old model, this one, and I've sliced it with the following settings. So I've got a 15% cubic infill, and 0.15 millimeter layer heights, and I've scaled it by 150%, so it's a little bit larger than, than normal. So if we go down to the bottom of the model, we can see as it gets printed, it's got that cubic infill, which is good. I don't want the base to be solid plastic, uh, but I need support for the little arms that start to be printed. But you can see as they are printed, they've got these little tiny little red things in them. And that's infill, that's the cubic infill. Because the way infill works with a slicer is it's like imagine a 3D mesh of infill and where the model intersects it, the infill will be in the same area. So if I move this model, the infill doesn't move with it. The infill is just where it's intersecting in that 3D space. But I don't want infill in these arms because with a torture test like this, where you've got steep overhangs and thin, thin details, uh, you want to min minimize these ex excessive movements. And like you see, the infill is not going to help anyone. It's really quite useless. There is a setting though that is sort of designed to get around this issue. And if you go to print settings, and infill, there's an option in the uh, advanced menu if you turn on expert. So the expert tab is solid infill threshold uh, area. So if I make this, let's say 15 millimeters squared, any area that's that or smaller will just be given solid infill. You can see that now these areas are just solid. It's actually completely solid all the way up like this, except for like some areas where the, the area is uh, larger. 
but for the small detailed delicate areas, it's now solid, right? Which is good, but that's also gonna take a lot more time because you're doing little solid infills. What I would like to see is the reverse option of this. With certain areas, I wanna have the option to say, don't put infill in, just don't bother. It's not gonna help anyone, it's too small. Don't bother putting infill in. And I know a lot of you are probably saying, well, Angus, you can do that with a height modifier. You can say, okay, in this model, I'm gonna put a height modifier in, so just the base is told to do infill, and then the rest is told to not do infill, which, yes, would work with this model, but A, it needs a little bit more setup, and B, uh, if you have a model that has some larger geometry throughout that lattice that needs infill, then you, it's not really gonna help you. I want something that's a little bit more intelligent than just doing a modifier. And to kind of help make my case, here's another example where I think that setting could be handy. Here I have a low poly Pikachu, a Floralistic classic model. And what I've done here is I've, in the print settings, I've changed the uh, solid infill threshold area to 50 millimeters squared, which is quite large. And you're gonna see with this model, when it's sliced, that means that the ears are solid and the tail is solid, but the rest of the model is, uh, is filled with infill, so it's not solid. So imagine the inverse of this. Imagine the ability to make the tail of this Pikachu hollow by doing this, and the ears hollow by doing this. The model would print great. Uh, it doesn't need, doesn't need infill there. It doesn't need to be solid, that's for sure. It would take a lot less time and use less material. So unless it's already possible and I've completely missed it, if so, please berate me in the comments. I think the inverse of that setting would be really handy. And this video has just been my own opinion on the latest Prusa Slice. It's already been out for a while. I've been using it quite a bit. I haven't been asked to make this video. I haven't been paid to make this video. I just think it's really cool free software that you guys should definitely check out. And if you found this video useful, then maybe consider subscribing to Maker's Muse, where it is my aim to empower your creativity through technology like this. Catch you later, guys. Bye.